The following podcast is scheduled for one ball with no time. Super hot fire. The greatest spectacle in podcast entertainment. Mr. Nestle That was literally verbal diarrhea. I'm setting the bar awfully low. Titus O'Neil keeps running directly into that bar. Get him off my TV, get him off my TV. You make me very angry. The man who has a better IQ than you, the awe-inspiring JC. You should go work for WWE because you'd be so up far on Vince's No, butt. no, no, no. Oh, you are no, such no, a no, suck-up. No, no. You, you are. defend everything, all the bad moves they make. This is the Chopper Knocker Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that's right. I'm not Nestlemania. He gone. Not forever, just for a week. But we have someone filling in, a very special guest, a member of our team, Ray Ray, welcome to the show, man. Man, I really appreciate that introduction, but I'm afraid I'm going to need you to do it again, but this time with a little bit more conviction, because after <laughs> going an unprecedented 9-0 and in predictions at Super Showdown, there is no doubt in the world that I am the best in the world! Oh, wow. Well, that was impressive pipes, but you're already starting <laughs> off with a Shane McMahon reference. This, I don't know how this is going to go. Are you going to make me miss Nestle by the end of the show? Uh, I, I, have, I have some goals that oh, I'm hoping God. to achieve yeah, by the end of the day. That's a horrifying thought, but uh, welcome to the show. Happy to have you on, because we've got a big week to talk about, and a very Ooh. special week. Well, like, special and some, I don't know. Super Showdown. We're going to talk about it. Happened last Friday. Uh, you were there on the scene. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have a little bit of a different perspective, but we're not going to hit in everything, because honestly, a lot of the stuff, just did, they're doing it again. But to me, my biggest shine of the show was Triple H, Randy Orton. I thought that match ruled. It was an old-school, hard-hitting match. It showed that if you give Triple H the right type of dance partner, he can still really work a really good match. And obviously, everyone who listens to this knows I love Randy Orton. He's one of my favorite of all time. So I thought that match was great. I enjoyed it bell to bell. It had me in. So, yeah, that's my biggest shine of the show. Uh, that was a fantastic match. Uh, unfortunately, I was having trouble hearing it because Triple H almost blew my eardrums out with that uh, <laughs> motorcycle that he was driving down the ring. To be honest, I, I, I'm such a I'm a Finn Balor guy, mm-hmm. so to see the Demon live, you know, right there in person was absolutely amazing. Obviously, him and Andrade are going to deliver every single time that they go out there. So I thought that they honestly had one of the matches of the night. I think you and I can both agree, though. Baron Corbin versus Seth stud. Rollins, He's stud, fucking amazing, right? Stud, absolutely amazing. And I love the Brock Lesnar stuff yes. at the end too. For him to come out, tease the cash in, and then for Seth to just completely annihilate him with a steel chair the way that he did was absolutely incredible. And it was brutal, too. Yeah. The chair was destroyed by the time he was done. It was absolutely, it was just unreal. But yeah, absolutely. I thought it was a great show from top to bottom, with the exception of the main. The main event was a fantastic match until the bell rang. Um, <laughs> it it kind of went downhill from there. But those entrances were fantastic. Overall, though, I thought it was an absolutely amazing show. And the people that decided not to watch it, I think you really kind of missed out. Um, you know, again, a lot of the undercard stuff was great. Triple H, Randy Orton was great. Andrade Balor. Corbin, the tag team match, even Lars versus the Luchas, I thought was actually God. pretty good. I mean, I, I, it was, it was, it, You're it, losing it, me there. It's, it served its purpose. I didn't love the way that it ended, to be honest. I mean, I get the whole DQ, weird. the whole DQ finish I get because they didn't want, you know, you want Lars to win, but like, cause you, so you don't want him to eat the loss. Like it would have made more sense for me, for him, for some reason to get disqualified, but I mean, I guess, I don't know. It, it is what it is, but I still enjoyed it. I thought it was, I thought it was a great show. Well, that's good. I, I overall, I didn't think it was terrible. It, was, it exceeded my expectations because, like you said, Demon Andrade was fine. I completely skipped Shane Reigns, not going to lie. Don't care. Saw Shane won. I'm like, knew it. But, I mean, to me, honestly, the Taker-Goldberg match, in a weird way, I was just – I was watching. I was just, like, smiling. And I know that's awful, but it's just it's, – you know, I've been saying it for years. Geriatric jobbers. And it's nothing against those guys. They're two of the best ever, and I respect them. I think they're great. But this is why I think they shouldn't be doing it anymore. It's just – you know, you see it in any sport. When you're done, you're done. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's not a bad thing, but I get it. You want to bring back the big names, you're on the show, whatever. But it's just like, this is what you're going to get. It's unfortunate. I hope Goldberg and Undertaker are both okay because they took some nasty spills. But, um, well, you know, a big thing we kept hearing about the show was the heat. How hot was it really in that arena? Uh, it, was, it was exceedingly hot. It was, uh, it was 100 degrees at nighttime. 
um, when we were out there. So yeah, it was, I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, The heat alone made it probably one of the more difficult shows uh, that I've ever had to work. But, you know, we powered through it. We did what we had to do. Um, I was surprised. I didn't realize that they were talking about, you know, the heat and the weather as much as they were throughout the course of the night. Every now and again, I would look up at the screen and I would see like the temperature thing at the bottom. I'm like, why do they keep putting that up there? (laughs) But apparently it was because they just kept talking about it. So, which is understandable. You know what I mean? And for a guy, again, like Baron Corbin to wrestle in full slacks and a dress (laughs) shirt, you know, and he's out there, it's a hundred degrees, you know, like it was just brutal i'm in shorts and a t-shirt and i was dying so i mean props to him i mean i tell you there's just nothing that guy can't do yeah no and uh any other last notes you have about super showdown yeah to be honest i'm gonna tell you right now that crowd out there in saudi arabia they are ready for a women's match um when they put up the advertise they they advertised a bunch of stuff for stomping ground they advertised both women's matches up there and both those women's matches got huge pops from the crowd love it so those people are ready for a women's match i actually had some kids in the crowd asking me if the women's match was going to be coming up next or if they were going to be wrestling and i had to say no i'm sorry and they were definitely disappointed so i mean look i don't understand politics i don't know any of that stuff but i can tell you for a fact the crowd that's out there the kids that are watching those shows out there they are ready for a women's match and i really hope that it happens sooner rather than later that's good to hear as we know it's obviously the political stuff reasoning but that's good that the that they're ready for it um so yeah that's that's the one thing about these shows final note about it for me it's like yeah it sucks because of the stuff going on with saudi arabia but when you watch those shows and you see the kids in the crowd it's like those kids have nothing to do with the government they're still kids yep this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for them. You can tell that they're relishing it. So for me, in a way that does make it worth it in a different way, it obviously is a double-edged sword. But yeah. you know, you gotta focus on the positive sometimes with these things. Uh, but yeah, speaking of positives, speaking it's time of- to go to the shine, baby. We're in the regular part of the show, and I don't know about you, but my favorite part of the week, the super shine of the week. All I have to say is yeah. Say yeah. New Raw Tag Team Champions, The Revival win the Triple Threat. Finally, the titles are back on TV. Now they'll stay on TV because they're with the best damn tag team in the business. They added the Usos to the match without telling us. They advertised or whatever, but they do a lot of that. But I, to me, I thought this was great. Oh, it was a fantastic match. It was a wonderful triple threat. The fact that they added the Usos, at first I was kind of confused, but then I thought to myself, why not add the Usos? They're yeah. one of the best tag teams in the division. Plus... You know, the rival, uh, Revival and the Usos have been having this feud. They're kind of, uh, they're, they're at 50-50. Or I think Revival might be up 2-1, to one, I want to say, the last time that they, that they went against each other. The Revival kind of made it a point to say, hey, we're still up 2-1 to because I think Usos won at Super Showdown. And it was funny, too, because that's what a lot of people were arguing about. They were just like, oh, well, how come, you know, people on the internet complaining and everything. You know, like, oh, well, the Revival lost to the Usos, then, like, how come the Revival is getting a tag team match on Monday Night Raw? Well, it's like, hey, guess what, pal? Fuck you. First of all, now the Usos <laughs> are in the match, first of all. And second of all, maybe if for two seconds you actually paid attention to what was going on, the Revival was out helping Shane McMahon the week before. Shane McMahon's in charge of the company, so obviously, why wouldn't they get a tag team shot? It's called You Scratch My Back, I'll Scratch Yours. So that's exactly how they ended up in that match. And what did they do? They took advantage of a, an amazing opportunity that was presented to them. They beat... One of the greatest tag teams of all time in the Usos, and also Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins, who are okay too, and reclaim the tag team titles that they so rightfully deserve. They should have. They should hold on to forever and a day. <laughs> and I tell you, I am just unbelievably happy about this. And it's just, it's going to be great as long as they don't start fucking losing again in non. Oh, then they definitely will. Every goddamn no doubt, week. No doubt. And, <laughs> you know what I mean. And, but as long as they're on TV and they're doing their thing. Then they just there's 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 nothing better than that and yeah we're super happy about that. Well, you mentioned the Usos right there being one of the best tag teams in the world. Our boy Billy is working on a piece. I'm not sure if it'll be out today or later in the week about about the Usos. So be on the lookout on Jobberknocker.com for that as well as the 205 Live recap by our boy the Joe Stopper, which that show seemed like super hot fire last night as well as NXT and NXT UK by TJ and Brandon. So be on the lookout for those on the website. But what else you got? You're killing these transitions, by the way. I just want to point that out. It's like you're a TV guy or something like that. You just know how to get from one thing to the other. I mean, if we're going to keep talking about, if we're just going to keep talking about our super shines and me and you are just going to sit here having a great party. Oh, give it to me. Give it to me. Can we not? Can we spend a minute here and talk about how awesome Baron freaking Corbin is? What a freaking monstrous reaction he got at the beginning of Raw. I don't understand why people don't like this guy. And I tell you, I sit there and and I've had people come up to me over the last couple of weeks now. And they say, oh, you still watch the WWE? You know, who are your favorites? Who do you like? And I tell them, yeah, you know what? I'm a big Finn Balor guy. And then I say, and you know what? I said, to be honest, and I have to pause because I already know what's going to happen. I have to tell them. 
I fucking love Baron Corbin. Oh, this is great. And I get the same reaction every single time. They roll their eyes. Oh, jeez, Baron Corbin. What do you mean? <laughs> that guy sucks. That guy's terrible. It's like, well, the fact that you feel that way means, number one, he's doing his job and he's doing his oh, job yeah. great. And he has been for quite some time. And I'll admit, I wasn't always a Baron Corbin guy. It honestly wasn't until he shaved his head and the GM stuff. <laughs> the GM stuff was where I really started to like turn around. And now I am all in on Baron Corbin. I think everything that he's been doing is fantastic. His promo work is great. And his in-ring work, I don't understand why people are trying he's to say really that he can't good wrestle. Wrestler, yeah. He's fucking great. He's very good. All of his matches have been great yep. over the last few months now, especially. His match with Seth Rollins at Super Showdown was fantastic. And the way that they ended it was great because it left it open. I know everybody complains about rematches, but it makes sense the way that they did it. He went out and he said, hey, look, this referee didn't know what he was doing, blah, 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 blah. The referee totally screwed him out of the title, which is 100% true. And then he comes back, and again, he calls back to his GM stuff, which you don't see a lot of. You you don't see this these callbacks, and that's the stuff that everybody wants to hear. They want to hear, oh, we want long-term booking, and we want callbacks, and we want them to acknowledge things that happened in the past. What did he do? He came out, he said, hey, I learned a few things while I was a GM. I made some connections, and that's what happens in the real world. When you go to a job, if you leave that job, guess what? You still have those connections. You still got those hookups. So you make some phone calls, you send out some texts, you say, hey, man, look, this is what happened. His referee kind of screwed me over. What do you think we can do? You pull some strings, and that's exactly what he did. Now, not only does he have his rematch for the universal title but he gets to pick hand pick his own special guest referee which is perfectly fair and it makes oh, sense yeah. because I, you can't trust those he can't trust those referees okay. now and they're I, all out to get him i love the way they did that segment too because out came Sami Zayn. which if you're a shit hitting heel what you want to do is you want to latch yourself to the guy at the top because then you're hoping that like i like you said earlier you scratch my back i scratch yours. they played that up with sammy and i just love the look of when he brought out ko too i'm like i kind of really like sammy and owens with corbin i'm like those three would be a fucking badass heel stable like you talk oh man Got me in it, of course, and the next night they had to ruin it because they did the same thing, but with Dolph, whatever. Uh, SmackDown is doing it's the same show, just with like one different person. But whatever, we're not we're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the good stuff. And um, you know, I, I yeah, top to bottom, I love this segment. Baron Corbin is the top heel in the company. It's indisputable. He's that damn good. He deserves to be facing Rollins. He should fucking beat Seth Rollins. I don't know if he will, but loved it. What else he got? I agree. He absolutely should. Okay, look, I, I, a lot of people seem to be on the fence about this, but to be honest, I love the twenty four seven title stuff. I love what they've been doing. I love that they've been mixing it on the show with the social media. The stuff with them stuck in the elevator this week that was, good. was fucking hilarious. With EC3 pulls a fork out of nowhere and he's like, hey guys, if we're in here for too long, we're going to have to resort to cannibalism. Like, where the hell does he come up with that stuff? It's fantastic. So now what? Not only is he walking around with a red solo cup, but he's also got a fork <laughs> in his tights too. Like, the guy's just ready for a party anywhere he goes. I want him to come he's over to my house and have a push, barbecue. Damn it. He is ready for oh. a push. They, they need to push him. He needs to be doing more than being stuck in an elevator. And I'm hoping that this is the opportunity because you see it all the time. You give these guys like a shit sandwich and some of them can really make of it ec3 starting to shine through a little bit because look it i still don't love this title i think it's kind of a stupid premise and i think eventually it's going to wear out but right now they're doing a great job with it it's they're clearly putting a lot of effort into it a lot of thought into it, it they're dedicating time they're giving it different looks everything they're doing right now is great which is what I expected. But I think I still think it's a short-term thing. But I hope that we get to see more stuff like this where another guy that was in that segment was Cedric Alexander. Exposes us to him more. Hey, I'd rather see him wrestle. But hopefully this is a step in the right direction where at least we see these guys and then maybe it'll translate into the ring. And that's what I'm really hoping for with EC3. And I kind of wonder if that was their plan with, the, with, with this whole 24-7 title thing. It was just like, look, we're going to essentially take all these guys that we're not really sure what to do with and we're not really sure, you know, what they can do as far as, look, we all know that a lot of these guys are great in the ring, okay? And that's perfectly fine and understandable. But at the end of the day, WWE and wrestling overall, it's, a, it, it's about more than just being yeah. in the ring. You need to be able to cut promos. You need to be able to, con, uh, you need to, be able to you know, connect with the audience. So to be able to figure out which of these guys has the ability to do that, it's like they're literally just saying, like, we're going to stick all these guys in a room together and see who rises to the top. And it makes perfect sense if you think about it. So that's why at the end of the day, I do think I was on the fence about the 24 seven title stuff. I mean, obviously the belt itself is ugly as sin so and there's ugly. nothing, but there's nothing we can do about that. It's already <laughs> out there. There's nothing we can do. So we just have to kind of move on and see what we can figure out as far as what's going to work for it. So that's why I think overall they've been doing a great job for it. And on top of that, they've been able to also transition it into the social media stuff. So now, we're getting 24-7 title stuff even on days when there's not television. And it's great. So you're logging onto Twitter and you're checking things and you're trying to see like, oh, what's going to happen next? Drake Maverick, is he going to do some stuff? I popped up on Drake's Maverick Twitter like a couple weeks ago because of this 24-7 title stuff. It was hilarious. You know what I mean? He's done a really good job. He's one of those guys that really – and he, Triple H said it in like an interview. He's like, look at like Drake just started doing that stuff on his own. We really liked it, so we incorporated it to TV. And that's what you talk about when they, you always hear the thing, grab the brass ring, whatever. It's like some guys, you're not just going to get an opportunity. You really got to take it. 
And that's what I'm hoping EC3 is doing, along with Drake and some of these other guys. I mean, genders resurface a lot, where now he's like one of the centerpieces of it. He won it in the fucking plane, and then R Truth won it back. Like, that stuff is entertaining stuff. I just, I still am worried about the long term thing because I think this just has a shelf life. But for now, you're right. It is Shine. As much as I hate to admit it, it is. But uh, for me, I love the Miss TV segment on Raw because last week I came on here and was talking about how excited I was for the US title. Like, there's so many guys in that division that I want to see, and Nestle said, no one cares about it. This week, there were six guys that cared about it, and I felt great. Uh, obviously, Samoa Joe came out for the Miz TV, but then they did the Dog and Pony show. I was like, oh, Braun, okay, Braun, Samoa Joe. That's something I still want to see. And out comes Lashley. I was like, okay, isn't like, eh. But then Ricochet, fucking love Ricochet, and Cesaro. And then, you know what? Six-man tag happened. Don't tell Nestle that I mentioned this in the shine. <laughs> that was a really fucking good six-man tag. That six-man tag was fucking fantastic. We are so unbelievably on the same page about this. It's going to blow your mind because I actually had that written down. The six-man tag, I literally wrote six-man tag equals heat. And then I went, and then at the bottom I said, wait a minute. Nope. Six-man tag was fucking great. It was so good. <laughs> and how about how about Strowman off the top of that match? Oh, he's out great. there doing flips like he's a freaking luchador. <laughs> luchador for the best, I mean, that's ridiculous. That is the best Braun Strowman has looked in like eight months. Exactly. And if, I feel like that's just who he is if you get Give him time to do that stuff if you don't kind of like, you know, put him in this box of like, you're a big guy. All you do is come out and roar He's and break stuff. He's a freak athlete. He's so good. He's fa- He is fast. He can move. He yep. can do these things. So why not let him do it, you know? And to pair him up with Lashley, I thought was actually a pretty good move because Lashley's kind of in that same boat. Yeah. He's a big guy that can move, which is why, again, it's another match at Super Showdown that I thought exceeded expectations. I was pleasantly surprised by that match too. Yes. Yeah. And the entrance to that was fantastic with Lashley coming out on the stage and then Braun comes out and just throws the fucking thing yep. across the room. Oh, it's absolutely awesome. Great. Again, Again, Super Showdown was a good show. Everybody should watch it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm looking at Raw. Uh, well, we got a... I almost blew it here. We're called the Jobber Knocker. We had fucking Jobber Alert. Iconic. Oh, my God. Now, yeah. th- these, these, these women, I, they, I've always been a big fan. They're great. Loved them in NXT. Love them on the main roster. They're great at cutting promos. I, when they first started doing this, like, Jobber thing, like, I loved it, and then they kind of dropped it. I'm glad it came back. This needs to go a little further than me. Like, where the hell are the... Kabuki Warriors or whatever, but for me, at least, like, I'm glad that they're at least getting an opportunity. They, they're they never really on SmackDown anymore, but at least, like, on... That's the nice thing I like about this title being on both shows, is Raw has the extra hour, so you can find a way to get them a segment on that show, even though it's not really their show, but it's getting us those champions on TV, which is something they're struggling with. But I thought overall, it's a great segment. They beat the jobbers. Um, Nestle always has the names. I'm horrible with names, so yeah. I don't have the names. I'm sorry, but we had our first of two job alerts of the week. So, to be honest, I actually, I was going to talk about some of this stuff a little bit later. What? Yeah. And to be honest, if I was to pick one of the two, I actually liked the other jobber segment a little bit Oh, yeah, the other jobber was YOLO County the, Tag Team Championships? Exactly. They had the Cardboard Tag Team Championships. I looked like me when I was 14 years old. You know what I mean? Just walking around with a <laughs> with a championship belt made out of cardboard and duct tape. Like, it was fantastic. I understand what they were trying to do. To be honest, I just don't understand why they had to do it twice. They li- well, I, to me, it was like they basically did the same thing twice. They said, okay, we're going to have Daniel Bryan and Rowan come out, and they're going to beat some jobbers, and then the Iconics are going to come out, and they're going to beat some jobbers. I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, do we not have people on the roster they can beat? Why couldn't at least one of those teams beat or, you know, or go against some up-and-coming team, you know, like an NXT team or you know, somebody in development or something like that rather than just like these jobbers? I, I, I'm all for the jobbers. Don't get me wrong. I think everybody should have a job. Like Everybody needs to go to work. But to me, it's like I just, I just didn't understand why we had to do it twice. Well, I think you hit the crux of the problem with SmackDown is SmackDown literally is a rerun of Monday Night Raw. Like we saw with the opening segment, it was the same thing. You just switched Baron and Dolph. And mm-hmm. then, of course, you have a six-man tag. Like, of course. Mm-hmm. All that. But that, that's all stuff for later. But I th- you're hitting on the crux of why SmackDown's been so frustrating for me lately. But you know what? We're still in the shine. We gotta talk about who's always in the shine, Mandy Rose. I was wondering where this was. She's giving Ember Moon more magazines, and Ember's continuing to disrespect those magazines, just like they're disrespecting her ability to wrestle, which I would love to see again. But you know what? We got Sonya and Carmella. Um, Sonya wins, thanks to Mandy's help. They're a great team. Faye and Desire, always in the shine. Everything they do, I love it. But what I really love about this is it's that second tier women's feud that. We are, this is really the only one we get because a lot of the times it's just like the title picture. So I like that there's a little more depth here because that's just how you make new contenders. Yeah, perfectly understandable. I've always actually been a big Sonya Deville guy. And don't get me wrong, I love Mandy Rose. They're as well. both great. They're absolutely fantastic. And I was really happy because there was a, there was a little bit of a time there where it seemed like they were, gonna, they were teasing, uh, breaking them up, which I thought was a terrible idea. Agree. I think that they're great individually, but I also think that they're great together. And I think that they're, again, they're one of those teams that I feel like should be 
you challenging know, for the should titles. Be challenging for yeah. titles, you know. I mean, I get it. You don't want heel versus heel, but at some point, like, yeah, they could easily be challenging for the titles because they are that good. And yeah, I loved that match. I thought that it was great. I thought Sonya came out, really showed what she could do. Carmella was great. I feel like you know a lot of people give her a hard time as far she as can, not being. She, she can puts deliver. Very good matches, yeah. She can deliver absolutely. You know what I mean? And for her, and it was, and and, and again, going back, it, it was good to see because she. You know, there was the 24-7 title stuff, and Truth got himself locked into a, into a bin. She's like, oh, I got to go. And then she comes back. Like, it was a lot of fun. You know what I mean? It was just a good time. So, yeah, no, I completely agree. Yeah, so, Sonya and uh, Sonya and Mandy, absolutely fantastic. Do you got any more shine? Because I'm, uh, I'm out of sunshine for, uh, for this show. I do, but it might cause a bit of a transition. Uh, so should we hit the fun house first then? If you want to, like I said. Because, you know, I- we got to follow Nestle's rules a little bit. Even though he's not here, I like to break the rules. But, you know... The fun house, he says, it's kind of in like purgatory, so it's got to be in between shine mm-hmm. and heat. So uh, we're, what we'll do is we'll take a quick pit stop from the shine, and then we'll briefly go to shine. And I'll immediately hit the heat because I know what the fuck you're gonna say. <laughs> I'm not ready for that. That so we're gonna get to the fun house, which I really enjoyed it. Seemed like a lot of people really enjoyed it. Um, there was a murder in the fun house. That's creepy. As um, I'm gonna try to do my best, Nestle here, guys, and Detective uh, Pikachu Nestle, but sorry, Backcracker, everyone else who loves it. I <laughs> I was trying, and I'm just like I can't do it. I'm not a detective like him, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so it started with Bray putting up that sign, which was like, those who leave here, like it's dangerous. It's like, hmm, there's something there. It's like you're stuck here and you can't leave. Yeah. It was, it was a ban- so it's abandon so all hope, ye who leave, leave or try and leave, which is, I think, a take on what's supposed to be the, uh, the sign for when you're going into hell, which is abandon all hope, ye who enter. Exactly. So, yeah. So is it, the idea now is is you, you can't leave the fun house. So I think that does kind of speak more to the fact that fun house could be like a purgatory kind yep. of thing or you're stuck in hell. So, which is interesting. Yeah, and see, then, look, this is what I need. This is, I need someone to piggyback me on these things. Places. Things took a real turn. Oh, yeah, they did. Because, you know, and obviously you had the rabbit fighting with the buzzard, which, you know, as as we figured out, like, these are all Bray personas. Like, yeah. Rambling. You're trying to eat him again. Yeah. You can't, you don't eat your friends. Well, you know what? Honestly, I'm with the buzzard on this one. The rambling rabbit, we talk about that. Remember rambling Bray? That's what he represents. Like, you know? That, that was the brain that was just kind of like, that's when he started to lose a little steam. So, of course, no, you know. I can't get on board with this. Hey, you, you, the don't, rab- the you rabbit- don't eat your friends. <laughs> okay, well, fine. But he didn't eat. Okay, so he stopped him from meeting his friends. Then the rabbit made a grave mistake. He was trying to reveal the secrets of the funhouse, which you immediately saw that little, like, happy Bray kind of flicked, like, mm. ooh, no, you just made a big mistake. You know, it's like, okay, well, how will Bray punish him? Maybe he'll just put him in timeout. No. Yeah. Bray fucking murdered that damn rabbit. Smashed Rambling rabbit, he smashed it, with and ketchup hammer. exploded everywhere. Well, it wasn't ketchup. It was uh, it was rambling rabbit. It was rambling, rambling, rambling uh, like uh, like uh, like jelly. It was jelly, breakfast jelly, sauce. Yeah, breakfast spread or something breakfast. like that. Yeah, I will say one of the one of the more interesting uh, conspiracy theories that I saw actually online. I believe it was uh, it was the Joe Stopper that I want to say commented on something or shared it. Okay, and it was uh, somebody pointed out that they that it was in their opinion. That they noticed Bray Wyatt when he uh, transitioned or whatever, he had the eye makeup on and then the clown nose. And yeah. They said the eye makeup kind of looked a little bit like the eye makeup that Chris Jericho's been using, oh. except they put a clown clown nose on him, so they didn't know if that was like a subtle shot of Chris saw Jericho. I saw that they were taking. He was taking some clown. digs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I don't know. I don't know if a lot of people are buying into that theory, but I like it. I'm, when I first read it, it, yeah, I was totally <laughs> in. Yeah, absolutely. I thought that it was great. So yeah, no, it was uh, it was an interesting segment. The Firefly Funhouse continues to continues to deliver yeah. on a weekly basis. You know, I mean, there's a part of me that like. I, I'm kind of like I don't want it to end because it's so great, but at the same time, I also know that if it goes on for too long, it's just gonna it's just gonna wear itself out, you yeah. know. And then, but then I'm also afraid that's like, oh crap, what are they gonna do from here? Because it's already it's already at a level nine of awesomeness, yeah. And it's like I don't know if I have the faith that they're gonna be able to debut him on you know in the ring and bump it up to a ten, as opposed to they're gonna debut him in the ring and it's gonna drop down to like a four. You know, like yeah, it, it, I have, I have concerns, you know? Yeah. And I don't think you're alone in that. Cause I just, I just, anytime you get something like this, that's always produced backstage translating mm-hmm. to the ring is so hard. Yep. And no matter what you do, it's going to come off a little flat. Um, cause these are so pre-produced that they're made to look a certain way. It's hard to do that, especially live. But again, I just think they're continuing to hit it out of the park. I have Absolutely. faith in the direction they're going. seems like they're really letting Bray do what he wants to do, which I think is good. Um, so yeah, I think overall it's good, but I guess now, I, I don't know. Do you have anything else on this? Cause I, I, that's as deep of a dive that I can go on this. Second. I got, I got nothing else. All Nestle right. just, Nestle crushes this thing out of the park yeah. every single week. And it's just, I he'll mean, have to either do a video recap on vacation or next week. We'll have him like catch us up. Cause 
I just I can't do it. I just don't have the time to go that deep down the rabbit yeah. hole. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, to be honest. I see what you did there. Yeah. All right. Now, I get we could make a pit, quick pit stop in the shine before I cut you off and turn it to heat. So go ahead. Say it. I'm going to go ahead and say it out loud and proud. The Shane McMahon best in the world stuff <laughs> is some of the greatest television that's going on right now. And it has been for a while. And it's about time for people to get on board with this. Okay. I drew a line. I'll be honest. I drew a line in the sand. I was kind of on the fence about this whole Shane McMahon stuff. And I said to myself, you know what? Even though it's going to be from outside interference with Drew McIntyre, if Shane McMahon beats Roman Reigns at Super Showdown, I'm all in on this. Because that means that they're committed to this character, okay? If he was to beat The Miz the way that he, you know, if he was to, if he beat The Miz and then came back and lost to Roman, then I'd be like, no, this is fucking stupid. You guys aren't committed to this. It is what it is. But the fact that they had him beat Roman Reigns at, a, a, a pay-per-view at a network event of that caliber means that they're totally in on this. And you know what? I'm sick and tired of people sitting here trying to tell me that, oh, Shane McMahon's taking up all this TV time and oh, Shane McMahon this and Shane McMahon that. Are you not fucking paying attention to what's going on? Everybody's sitting there telling me, oh, this Shane McMahon segment, the Miz TV segment on SmackDown was stupid. Shane McMahon all over the place. I'm sorry. Did you not see Drew McIntyre out there on TV too? Shane McMahon's bringing Drew McIntyre up. If he wasn't for him, Drew McIntyre would probably be toiling away doing practically nothing. But instead, he's involved in one of the biggest and most important feuds on television. On top of that, The Miz also cut a freaking amazing promo on SmackDown during Miz TV on Shane McMahon, calling him out for all the bullshit, chicken shit heel ways that he keeps winning. And the fact that, yeah, you may have technically beaten me at WrestleMania, and you may have technically beaten me at the in the steel cage match, but the fact of the matter is, is I kicked the shit out of you, and it, which is absolutely true. And I know a lot of people were mad, but then I thought about it. The whole thing with the end of the match at WrestleMania was, again, that was the whole point. It was sh- The Miz just completely annihilated Shane McMahon, but then somehow, someway, Shane McMahon ended up winning. The fact is, is since the beginning, the best, this best in the world stuff has been great. Since he won it back at Crown Jewel, and even that, so many people were upset about it. They were like, oh, this is bullshit. Shaming man won best in the world. It doesn't make sense. It's so stupid. But the fact of the matter is, is that everybody leading into that tournament, all they did was talk about how the tournament was a sham. Oh, there's no guys from Japan. There's no guys from the Indies. How can you be the best in the world? And everybody that's in the tournament is basically from the United States. So if the, if the whole tournament... At, from from the beginning was a sham, then how are you going to sit here and tell me that the fact that Shane McMahon won speaks to whether or not he should actually be considered the best in the world? The best in the world tournament wasn't about determining the best in the world. The best in the world tournament was about setting the groundwork for what has been one of the most amazing long-term feuds in, in WWE this entire year. The, the whole stuff with The Miz was great. Everybody agreed that it was great. Even you said that you thought Through it was Through WrestleMania, great. Through and then WrestleMania. it was done. Exactly. And then it was done. And granted, I do agree, you know, the steel cage match, I don't think necessarily needed to happen, but it is what it is. All the stuff that he's doing now with Roman Reigns, at first I wasn't sure about it. Like, I was kind of on the fence. But to be honest, when I sat back and watched it, I'm like, this is great. He comes out and he calls out Roman Reigns. He's like, hey, Roman, why are you going to be a punk? Why are you going to be hitting my, why are you going to be punching my dad in the face? What kind of terrible human being punches an old man in the face and I'm going to stand up and I'm going to defend my father? Meanwhile, that's what he just did to the Mrs. Dad a couple months ago. So it makes perfect sense. He's such a great heel and he plays the character well. And on top of that, he is bringing other talent along with him. He's bringing Drew McIntyre. He's bringing Elias. He's bringing the Revival. The Revival got a tag team all championship right, right. match. Because of Shane McMahon. All right. You say bringing. I, for me, look at, I try with these segments. I try. But like, I literally just see it. And my big thing about the product right now is they're overexposing the too much stuff. If you want to do this on Raw, that's fine. But I just hate when they do the same thing on SmackDown. And you keep saying, bringing up Drew McIntyre. I think Drew McIntyre's never looked worse. To me, I'm bored with him. I knew Shane was going to beat Roman. I thought that was a great decision because they're clearly building him as a big heel. And that's fine. I didn't have an issue with that. The celebration at the end of that was great with him on McIntyre's shoulders. That stuff's all positive. But it's just then they come out and we're just, we're just convoluting everything. We're dragging it down. And we're doing the Miz thing again, which I just... When I'm, especially when I'm looking at SmackDown. SmackDown has so many more like men single stars than Raw. But for some reason, they're using the same set on Raw and SmackDown. Like, Kevin and Sammy are on both shows every week, which honestly, if you're going to wildcard people, wildcard those two. Because if I have to watch people wrestle twice, those are the caliber I want. But it's just like we're doing Miz TV twice in a week. You're talking about you don't want the same jobber matches. We're literally doing the same on-screen thing twice. That's where my biggest problem comes from it. And that's why a lot of the times when I, by the time I get to SmackDown, I'm fatigued by Shane. I think if they dialed it back a little he can still be present and backstage i like that he's involved like getting his guys the tag titles i don't have an issue with that it's more of just like it actually being in the ring because i'm looking at smackdown 
Rusev, Nakamura, Andrade, Finn, Ali, Buddy Murphy, Asuka, Kairi Sane, Shelton Benjamin, Liv Morgan. I know Mickey James is injured, but even like Randy Orton wasn't on SmackDown. I'm looking at all these names. Like Aleister Black is stuck in a hole screaming at nobody. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. we'll that's... get there in a second. But that's why to me this is tough for me because it's just, it's, yes, he bores me a little bit. I've, I, again, you were right. Through WrestleMania, I loved it. But since then, it's been hard for me to be a fan and I just, like, I was hoping the Miz, by being a part of the U.S. thing, I'm like, okay, Miz Joe would be interesting. Maybe this is him moving on from now. They can always revisit the Shane stuff later. But I think it's good every now and then, especially, like, with long-term feuds. The way they really work is if you, when after they hit, they kind of pull apart a little bit. We see it all the time. Like, you know, you go on and do something else, but they eventually meet back, and that's when it culminates at one of the big shows. We're obviously not near a big show right now, so that's why I'm like, this is good. Miz going after Samoa Joe. It's separate, and eventually I think he is back at Shane, however they do it. But by immediately on SmackDown, it's like, okay, the Miz is now defining the U.S. title. You have Shane still doing his thing with Roman, but now it's at least transitioned to, uh, to Drew and Roman. Sorry, someone just tried to FaceTime me. <laughs> um, so now I'm all thrown off. But, and I was like, okay, we're starting to like, the lines are like, they're kind of running parallel. And on SmackDown, we just throw it back into this big mess. And that's for me where it loses me. Like, I get it. Yes, he's getting other people around. Like, Elias is part of it. But honestly, the Elias stuff right now, it's like, he's not even really doing what Elias does best. He's not in the ring just like working the crowd. He's just kind of standing next to Shane like, hey, look at my buddy. I got a 24-7 title shot. Yeah. That's where my issue with it was. So I'm glad that you're enjoying it, Ray Ray, but I can't be with you on this no, one. No, I'm telling you, you got to get on board with the Shane stuff. Look, you have to understand something, okay? Back when, back when Shane first won the Best in the World tournament, everybody said that it was crap and they didn't like it. I was one of the few people that said, you know what? I think this is a great idea and it's going to work. And you know what? The exact same thing happened when Brock Lesnar won Money in the Bank. Okay, you know, you saw my tweet. I tweeted it out. I said, you know what? I said, Brock Lesnar winning the money in the bank, I think is going to be fucking great. And I caught a ration of shit for it. And now, what did you guys say last week? Oh, this is some of the, this is quite possibly the best thing going on right well, now. Well, you got to understand. So, look, if, I even said it that week on the podcast. I said, I'm coming off watching that Game of Thrones finale <laughs> of disappointment. And that is literally like what I watched. That was part of the reaction. And now, granted, we both did say, because yes, you were looking more forward where we were stuck in the moment, which I think is good by you. But it's just we also said, like, this could be good if Brock buys in. And Brock bought in, and we got Brock in the box, or boom box Brock, whatever the hell you want to call him. <laughs> Fucking and, Brock party, dude. But it's I just, I, I don't think the Shane's the same thing. No. I, I think I'm, you're on Ray Ray Island on this no, one, buddy. Well, that's fine. You know what? It, it, look, at the end of the day, if there's, a, if there's a room full of people, somebody has to be the smartest man in the room. Oh. And if it has to be me, then that's fine, oh. okay? That's, what I, that's, just, that's, that's what I will bear, and I have no problem doing that. But I'm just telling you, like, look, I've been right about so many other things, and I think I've just seen it. Look, I will, complete, I, I will agree. It is a little bit oversaturated. I didn't understand the fact that they had to have two Ms. TV segments, okay? I think the issue here, though, isn't necessarily the Shane McMahon stuff and the character he's portraying. I think the issue here is, which is the same thing we you're talking about, which is the fucking, the wild card rule, yeah. whatever the hell that is, you know what I mean? Like, even Kevin Owens threw out there on Monday oh, Night Raw, I, I, I'm here because of the wild card rule, whatever that. the hell that is, you know what I mean? Like, which, and, and I think everybody's kind of on board with that. It's just like, look, yeah, you're right. I don't mind this whole, the wild card rule isn't a terrible rule, but the execution so far has been a little bit iffy because the execution has just basically turned into, well, we're going to have a shit ton of people from either show whenever we want, and it's going to end up being the same people every single time. That's the problem. And therefore, it. you're going to, you're, you're not going to be able to bring up the people that you have. So you're going to end up with people that are going to have either nothing to do, which is why I think the fact that Drew McIntyre is paired with Shane McMahon is actually working out in his favor because I think if he but wasn't if paired with Shane and they had some else say if Shane had Bobby Lashley with him I don't think Drew McIntyre would be doing anything I think Drew McIntyre would be sitting back and would be uh, sitting in a fucking elevator know. with a 24-7 I title. think he was just on such fire even though they kind of put it out at Wrestlemania but even still like people are ready for him to be a top heel I agree like, and I think so too but I think him being with Shane is what's gonna get him there I hope you're right but I just I, I just can't I can't uh, I can't talk about this anymore oh uh, fine fine, fine. we'll move on to the next thing which you brought up earlier what the fuck are we doing with Aleister Black right now what in the fuck are we doing with Alistair Black? Why is he just sitting in a room screaming for somebody to pick a fight with him? And then when somebody on Twitter says, hey, pal, I'll fight you, he comes on the next week and says, I wish somebody would pick a fight with me. It doesn't make a damn bit of sense. Randy I don't Orton was trying it. to pick a fight with him on Twitter. It's ridiculous. I will give Alistair Black credit. The promo that he cut on SmackDown, it like I, it was engaging. He delivers those promos fantastically. But at the end of the day, they don't make any fucking sense. Mm -hmm. 
And I, it's just, I don't under, I don't know what's going on. Like, what the hell are we doing with Alistair Black? I don't know. But it's just one of those things. It's like I mentioned all those people earlier, and you can't even add him to the list. At least he's out like, getting promos, but it's just, there's so many. I didn't even mention the ones on Raw. Granted, a lot of the ones on Raw have been able to just hang out in the 24-7 picture. But still, it's just like, we got to get these people in the rain. Because that's, for me, like the big thing with Raw, I thought overall Raw was much better this week. But yeah. to me, I'm just looking the first hour, there's one match, and it's Lars and the Luchas. Like, who cares? Like, we, yeah, that was I a good need, match, though. It, it was it was fine because Lars squashed them and it ended that nonsense. I think I'm Whatever. getting on board with Lars Sullivan a little bit. I'm hey, you know what? Honestly, I've said it all the time, and I, I have to be. I understand the thing with Lars, but I honestly I, I do like the character overall. Yeah. Um, I think there's a good way to present him, and I think for the most part they're doing it right. Yeah. I think he's an interesting monster, which isn't always true, but I think he has that depth. And so I'm really interested to see how they do with him. But the problem with him is now he has that dark cloud that's going to fall. No matter how many times, like Titus can be like, look at he's tried. It's always going to be there, mm-hmm. which I think can work a little to get him a little extra heat. But it's just right. it's one of those lines you got to toe with him. But I think uh, I'm hopefully that's the end with the Luchas. He needs to move on to something else. Right. But even to that aspect. And again, going back to the whole thing about how we had all these tag team jobbers this week. Pairing him with the Luchas works out better than because other than that, what were they going to do? They would just bring them out and have them take on random jobbers all the time. You know what I mean? Which would be the exact same thing that they're doing with the tag team division. So at least pairing him with the Lucha house party gives them something to do. Obviously gives him, you know, somebody to get over and, and everything else, but it keeps him, I think it makes him a little bit more relevant because he's not just beating up jobbers. He's beating up these, the, the Lucha house party who are former, you know, tag, I think what they had tag team. Did they have tag team champions at one point? No. I think Kalisto was Kalisto at least a cruiserweight was, uh, champion, right? He's two time us champion, a cruiserweight champion. So, I mean, these guys have like, at least Kalisto, I just, I'm ready like, for him. I'm ready for him to move on to something. There's plenty of those guys in the back. Like a I agree. face. He's like, destroyed. Cedric Lucha Alexander. Cause yeah. Lars has proven. He's kind of like, he's one of those guys that can work well with smaller people, which is I think part of the reason yeah. why they did this. Cause he is very agile for a big guy. Mm-hmm. So, so I think there's plenty of guys they can have him use. I, but then it's also weird with him because he's on Raw every week, even though he's a SmackDown star. It's one of those things. It's just like that's the problem. with yeah. If we just stop throwing the same shit on SmackDown when he's doing Raw, you'd actually have time for all this fresh shit on SmackDown. And it would make SmackDown way more interesting. What did we love about SmackDown before? It was a wrestling show. It was fresh. It was different. Now it's just pretty much a Raw recap. Yeah. And it's like the, it takes the worst part of Raw's and we just see it again. It's just – that's my biggest problem with the structure of the shows, and it's because of this wild card thing. It's like, it's just, it's not it's not working for me. I it's one of those things. If SmackDown stars goes to Raw, it's usually fine, but it's the, when you go to SmackDown, it's like they already have one last hour, yep. and it seems like they have way more superstars. And there's a lot more superstars that like we really want to see because like we didn't like the women's division. I barely mentioned him there, but Ember Moon stuck just like reading Mandy's magazine in the back every week. I mean, there's nothing Ember wrong with fucking that. Fucking Moon. I would love to just sit around and read Randy's magazine. I for mean, hours I would too, end. but but I'm not Ember Moon. I didn't yeah. work my way up to the WWE exactly. main roster to wrestle. You know what I mean? Like she's, I'm just the dude that wants to hang out looking at uh, looking at a fitness. She's magazine. my favorite women's wrestler to watch in the entire yeah. division. I loved watching her NXT. It's just like she puts on a show. Like you're just drawn to the way she wrestles and like obviously the finishers to cap it off. But I think. At least by having her with Mandy and Sonya, that she's it's a it's a slow boiling feud, which I'm okay with. But it's like every now and then it's like, why not throw her out there in a jobber match and let her just like show off her moveset so when she does actually wrestle Mandy and Mandy and Sonya, the crowd's a little more familiar because it's kind of been like a whirlwind with her because she got called up, she did a little bit on Raw, then she got injured and went away, and now since she's come back, she hasn't done much. So a lot of your mass audience that aren't NXT viewers aren't familiar with this incredible fucking talent you have. So you can go down the line. There's plenty of people like that. But I mean, oh, absolutely. the other thing on SmackDown that we had that promo in the middle of the show with the New Day where everyone came out. But then they're like, oh, the match is later. It's like, OK, so why did we just first of all, this segment was fairly useless, but it's also we're separating it from the match. And it's just that's my problem. with It's like we open it with a, with a Miz TV, which is the same as Rob. And halfway through the show, we're having this six man promo. And then we take another break and we go to the end. And it's that, that match. It's like either stick it together or don't do it at all. It's just it's it's. You're just overexposing. Right now, Kofi, for me, is so on fire that they can't put out that flame. But everyone else is just kind of like, come on. Don't yeah. don't make Sammy and Kevin lame for me because they're two of my favorites. Right, and I think that just goes back to the original point of things being oversaturated. Yeah. Sammy and Kevin were fantastic on Monday Night Raw. Now, the thing that sucks about that is that they're fantastic on the show that they're not technically on because they're supposed to be SmackDown guys. Sammy's on Raw, though. Sammy's he? a Raw yeah. guy. Okay, so yeah. there you go. Kevin but, Owens is on SmackDown. But that's what I mean. Like yeah. they did, they do all their best work on the show that, on this other show, and then they come over to SmackDown, and you're just like, well, here we are, just doing the same shit over and over again. And it's just like you said, the whole I think I think the issue is, and a, a lot of these issues that we keep talking about is. 
it all goes back to the same thing. It all goes back to this oversaturation, and it goes back to, quite frankly, the wild execution card, of the fucking wild card yeah. rule. Like, let's just put an end to this. Speaking thing. of, well, first, let's, let's see. This is another thing on Raw. It's like we do the be- Becky Lacey interview backstage thing, which wasn't great. No, but it's like that should have been it for them that week. But instead, we have to have to do a fucking silly tag match, which is useless, and have this Bailey Alexa feud from two different shows. Like again, the Nikki Cross Alexa stuff, I am loving. I think it's a diamond in the rough right now. It's really interesting because we all know Alexa's manipulating her, but it's great TV because like Nikki's being different and we know it's exciting because eventually they're going to have a payoff. But having Alexa involved with Bailey on this other show, it's like now you're starting to oversaturate the storyline. I'm getting worried about it. It's still fine, but that tag match didn't need to happen on Raw. Like it just the, the backstage segment with Alexa and Nikki was fine, but it's like why is Nikki wrestling Bailey on SmackDown? Like SmackDown already has way more women. Have Bailey wrestle someone? Like just it's it doesn't it's it's not working for me. No, I com- I completely agree. And I, while I do I do really love the Alexa and Nikki stuff, um, I think it's been great. Mostly just because it's putting Nikki Cross on my TV, which is what I've wanted literally from day one. Because I love Nikki Cross and I love Alexa Bliss. I'm really happy to see mm-hmm. that she's back. She's overcome um, what I've heard was like multiple concussions oh, yeah. or injuries or God knows what. So it's like to see her back is also fantastic. And I love having her in a title picture, even though it's a title picture for a title that she's not actually on the show <sighs> for. But hey, fucking wild card rule, we can do whatever we want. Here's my only thing, and I've seen a lot of people kind of complain about this on Twitter, and I, as much as I hate agreeing with people that complain about things on Twitter, I do <laughs> kind of agree. These whole women's feuds that are based around, like, these petty things, and it's tough because it seems to be, like, the thing that they've got, like, Alexa Bliss kind of shoehorned into, and that's just, like, all of her feuds are these, like, petty things. She's like, well, she said something mean about you, and, like, her whole thing with, like, Nia, all those, you know, like, a couple years ago and all this other stuff. They need... Like, why can't we do more, like, better, more meaningful storylines with the women's wrestlers, with the, with, with the women's division? You know, like, why does everything have to be this, like, these, like, petty little things? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, why can't they build meaningful stories that actually that actually speak more to their characters and speak more to what they're trying to do as opposed to just, like, oh, hey, did you hear, like, she said something mean about you? Or, oh, Nia was a, a bully and blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, like, it's just kind of dumb shit and I don't understand it. And I think that that's one of the main reasons people are kind of getting starting to get a little frustrated with some of the women's division. I think it was one of the things that kind of hurt um, even the evolution pay-per-view that they had, that they did last year. It was a great idea. And I think a lot of people wanted it and they want a second one and they want, and you know, they want another one and they want these women to be able to kind of come up and do things. But it's just, it's pointless if you're not going to have the, if you're not going to have more meaningful stories. I think that's probably one of the things like if even a fraction of any of the internet rumors about Sasha Banks are true, which I really don't believe at all. But at the same time, I can understand if she's frustrated with the direction of, of the women's division and the stories that they're, that they're clearly just kind of not telling. I can understand that. I'd want to get up and walk away too. Because well, let me put just it like, this way for you. you. If, if I was a woman in the division, the only woman that I, if I were any of the women in the division, the only one that wouldn't be frustrated to me is Becky. Yeah. Because Becky's the one who got a chance. Like she became the man and the, like that feud with Rhonda and Charlotte and everything that was booked just like a feud. It didn't have the petty stuff. And look at like occasionally, like I don't mind that stuff being mixed in here. Cause I did with the men too over stupid shit. Like every now and then, but like you said, it's everything like the yeah. Mandy Naomi one was good. It was natural. It was like, yeah. it brought in the Usos. Like it was, I was like that by itself was fine. But the problem is when all your feuds are petty like that, it just, yeah. it devalues and you're t- like, they, they don't. I like the everyone. What they say about that is true. They don't need that. And I'm gonna get a little more of that in my hope. Um, oh. I don't know if you have anything more heat. I'm out. Um, I don't think, I think so. We I mean, I kind of. Yeah, I mean, we covered just about everything. I mean, I, again, and I think we talked about this before. I didn't have a lot of heat this week. I mean, I, I'm a pretty positive guy. I like to. I always try and see the good in just about everything, you know. So it's kind of tough for me to find heat. Like I was literally trying to find heat. Um, but yeah. Well, if you like Shane McMahon, then I can see how that's a problem because everything him, he's like walking like. Ugh, but you know. Hey, like I said, if We've I gotta, if I gotta be the smartest guy in the room, then that's just what I gotta do. You know. Well, what you I mean? know what? That's the hit I'll take. It's time to get hopeful because after coming off that heat, man, just especially for me because I'm a positive guy like you. But you know, mm-hmm. wrestling can wear you down. We gotta get glorious. No, it's not about Robert Roode, even though I'd like to see him do a little something besides mm-hmm. chase around our truth. But my hope is about the women's tag team titles. We touched on this a little bit, and look at like I dig everything the Iconics are doing, but they haven't really defended or done anything with those titles yet. They started to, after they won after WrestleMania, they brought out Paige and the Kabuki Warriors, Asuka and Kairi Sane, two of the best female performers in the company. They do a little something with them. They finally give them a name. The internet didn't like it, so guess what? We haven't seen them on TV at all since. And then you're looking, it's like the Iconics just kind of float around. They're feuding with people who aren't tag teams, like I feuding in air quotes. So it's like there's no real division here, and this was my fear about why like not establishing Bailey and Sasha longer at WrestleMania. It was like you have legit heel challengers in 
um, Fire and Desire, the Iconics. Um, before Nia, we knew she had to have double knee surgery. It was like Nia and Tamina. Like, there's a like a line of heel teams in the women's tag division where Bailey and Sasha they can have some interesting feuds. They can establish these titles. They'll be on TV because it's on two of the biggest stars in the company, two of the four horsewomen. But instead at WrestleMania, they did the big moment, which again, happy for the Iconics. I love them. It was a nice little twist, whatever. But my worst fears came true. Is those titles kind of just became if they were on TV, they're kind of treated like a joke and like as much as i enjoy these jobber matches it's like okay well that's like the first step in creating something like where are the contenders why aren't people out there like actually chasing them down like i get it like the the best team to do it would be mandy and sonya right now but they're heel versus heel that's always tough and they're actually doing a good job of using them on smackdown with ember moon and they got a feud going with carmelo which that stuff is good so i'm fine with that but it's like you had this team you're starting to establish and asking Kyrie sane and you just dropped it completely, which I think part of it's because uh, it happened around the same time the wild card bitches like happened, so it's taken away time from these other things. But in the tag team divisions across the board have suffered. Now, hopefully, with the men's with two legit heel champions, we're on our way. But the women's tag titles need something. So my overall hope is that let's get some contenders in here. I think the Kabuki Warriors are a great place to start. I'm assuming they're the team that's eventually going to get those championships off the Iconics. But let's do like the thing about them is you can do like a three month feud. Because here's the thing about the Iconics. They're sniveling little shits. They can cheat. They can get DQ'd. You can drag this out. And it's one of those things. It's like they don't have to wrestle every week. You can simply do a backstage segment or something with them. You know, that's the nice thing about having all this talent is you can space it out. So you can make a feud that if you, like normally it would be like a month, you can stretch it out to two and it'll be more interesting. It'll be fresher. So I hope next week it's like now that the Iconics, like they're in the rain and we got some things going. Let's get them some contenders. Let's get them the Kabuki Warriors. Asuka and Kairi saying, like, I want Adventure Time with JC back, damn it. <laughs> Hashtag JC's hopes come true. Hashtag JC knows. That's my hope. Wow. That's fantastic. I'm definitely on board for that because I want to see the women's tag team division definitely, you know, start to, you know, start start to, I don't know, rebuild, I guess, for lack of a better Just word. Just exist. Because it's been shit for so yeah. long. You know what I mean? Like I said, again, I understand if, you know, if Sasha, if they told Sasha this is what they're going to do, I would fucking walk away too because it's bullshit. <laughs> Anyways, on to my hope, which is something I came up with uh, this week as I was watching SmackDown. And it was kind of something that you touched upon. Kofi Kingston is fucking on fire right now. He's fantastic. Everything that he's doing is great. But I honestly believe and i kind of think the feuds that he has been in mm, haven't been top level they you haven't don't been think Dolph is great Dolph is um, the comeback from Dolph was good he's he Dolph is good don't get me wrong like but no he's Should not have been a one off he's he's not that he's not that you know big talent Kofi to me for this for this title run of his to mean something he needs he needs a feud that's 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 really going to take him to that next level he needs something really Big. Oh no. Which is why I came up with this. Oh no. I think I think it's time to pull the trigger. Oh no. I think it's time for Big E. Oh, okay, okay. I was scared we were going. No. <sighs> did you think I was gonna say Shane McMahon? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Dude, the way this podcast is going, I did. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. I'm thinking even bigger than that. Okay, okay, I like this. I like this. I think it's time for Big E to make his turn. I think Big E needs to turn on the new day. And to be honest. I think this is the time to do it because it makes sense. Because guess what? When Big E was injured, what did they do? Kofi went out and he won the WWE Championship. In the beginning when they got together, it was supposed to be about them as a group together, battling and fighting and, and going out and entertaining the crowd. But when Big E got hurt, Kofi decided he was going to go out and do something on his own. Kofi became selfish. He went out and he won the WWE Championship. And then what did they do? They didn't even care that Big E was gone. They, got they the tried to recruit Kevin Owens yeah. and how that worked out for them. So they didn't even, they didn't even care that, that, that Big E was gone. So to me, that makes perfect sense. Big E should have a gripe with them. Big E should be mad because Kofi has decided it's no longer about the group. It's about him. Mm -hmm. So it's time for Big E to stand up for himself and to tell them, you know what? No more. And I think that this is honestly, uh, this could be a great feud that could take us through the entire summer. A lot of people are saying that Brock Lesnar is going to end up cashing in on Kofi Kingston so that he can be the champion on SmackDown when Fox takes over. And whatever, it's a rumor, it is what it is. But to get there, I think a Big E versus Kofi and Xavier, a Big E essentially versus the New Day feud could be something that could last months. I mean, we're talking matches through SummerSlam and into the fall until... And, and again, you could, honestly, you could see Brock Lesnar, I think, cash in on Kofi after Big E 
just beats the shit out of him. Yep. So Brock Lesnar didn't have to do anything. What if Brock Lesnar came and cashed in on Kofi without even having to deli- deliver a single F5 to him? He just hands in the briefcase and pins him for the one, two, three. I think it's time. I think it's time. I've loved the New Day from the beginning. I think that they've been great. Even when they very, very first started and they were a heel faction, I thought that they were entertaining as hell. And I thought, and I definitely, I saw, I saw something great there. And they have been great. They've been one of the best teams, hands down, in the company in the last, I don't even know how many years they've been together. It feels it's like been a lot, like 2014, maybe? Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And for them to be able to maintain that kind of momentum for that long is just unprecedented. But all good things have to come to an end. And I think that this is the time to do it. And it's and this is the time where it makes sense for Big E to come back and say, you know what? When I went out and I got hurt, Kofi, you got selfish. And you went out for yourself and you won the title on your own without me. And it's, and it's fucking bullshit. And then you went out and you decided you were going to try and recoup Kevin Owens to try and take over. And guess what? He couldn't do it. And you couldn't get anybody to replace me because there's only one Big E. I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. I really like I'm that. I'm telling you. I think, and it's going to, and it, it gives Kofi that huge emotional feud where he is now defending this title that he spent so long trying to get and he spent so long chasing after. Now he has to defend it against his, against a former best friend and a fucking huge dude. I like it. Who could easily just wipe the, wipe the, wipe the earth with him. It's ridiculous. I like it. Yeah. yeah I like yeah, it. Yeah. But don't call it a comeback. We're moving on to the final second. Well, second of final. Well, yeah, whatever. You know with AOP? Yeah, you know me. They were in the Battle Royal at uh, Super Showdown. Uh, so you know what? How could they not get my comeback? We're both AOP guys. Absolutely. You're team AOP. They're fucking great. Yeah. Now, the problem with AOP, the reason why they're not going to be on TV is, like I said earlier, two heel champions. So, And there's not a lot of challengers. We only have like one other team on SmackDown, and this is the Heavy Machinery, and they're challenging. And on Raw, like, the Usos are tagging up with Revival. Unless if AOP is feuding with, like, Lucha House Party or Kurt Hawkins and Ryder. Like, I don't know how they're going to integrate him back. But it was nice to see them to know that uh, Akam is healthy. Mm. Because, obviously, he had a major surgery. So, it's good to know that they're back and cleared. Um, So, they're a team that I just think that I'd like to see them used with someone. I think they could be a good heavy for someone in the meantime. It gets them on TV. It gets us familiar with them. Um, So... I would like to see them incorporated somehow, but I get like the struggle they're going to have bringing them back right now because of how heel dominant the tag team division is right now. Yeah, perfectly understandable. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I love the AOP. Uh, I was happy to see them in the in the battle royal, even though it was tough to see them in the battle it's tough royal to see anything because it was 50 royal. fucking guys crammed 51. into that ring. 51 guys crammed into that fucking ring. So yeah, that was ridiculous. But no, it was good. And I think they had a pretty they had a decent little showing too. I think they had uh, I think they eliminated a few guys and they yeah they were like fighting with good. Titus I think if I yeah. remember correctly. Yeah, that's true. My comeback of the week is going to Goldberg's locker room door. <laughs> uh, we haven't seen it uh, since what WrestleMania last year, I think it was. Um, it's it, it's a very solid door. And uh, uh, while Goldberg had a winning streak of what 197 and 0, I'm pretty sure he's 0 and 197 against his door, door yeah. because every time he decides he needs to headbutt the thing before he comes out and ends up most of the time he ends up busting himself open. So who knows what's going on there? So yeah, I can't, I, I couldn't help it. I love seeing the door back. I love seeing the door holding strong against Goldberg, no matter how hard he decides to headbutt the thing. Is that the last time we ever see Goldberg wrestle, or is he gonna go to the next side show? <laughs> Yeah. It is a nice paycheck for him. Honestly, yeah. hey, if I were them, as much as I give him shit, like I do the same thing because that is a fucking nice little purse you're taking home. I was surprised to see him there. I never really, I mean, I, I know he got paid a shit ton of money to be to do the event, but he never, to me, and I guess it was based on like his last run. He never, to me, came across as the type of guy who would just like, you know, if you pay me enough money, I'll show up. Because I mean, at the end of the day, like I, I figured. I mean, it seems like at least like he made a crap ton of money in WCW. He's done other things outside, so he he should be. I, I assume he's financially offset. It's not like he's oh, yeah, fucking sure he bankrupt. Is, you know what I mean? So it's like that's a lot of money to turn down. Though, just, I know. Yeah. And oh, granted, like I bet he expected like a five minute match, not like what they get, like ten. Like that's the danger. Yeah, with but these. he only it's remembers like, five. I, well, yeah, it's, it's true. But that's my biggest issue with this. It's like. A match like that, if you make it two to five minutes, no one's going to be mad. The entrances can be long. Like, just do the fucking spots and end the match. That's what that's what Goldberg is. It's like, do the spots and the match. But they tried to get cute with it, and it's just like, that's where you run the issues. We've seen it. We saw it happen with Stain. Pretty much ended his run. We've seen it with Triple H working with some other guys. Triple H, Batista, Mania, I thought, started off good, and then it just, like, took forever. It's just... You know, luckily he was working with Randy Orton at this one. So even though it was the longest match, like it worked because it was really fucking good. But that's because he's working with a guy who's still like Randy Orton. Maybe he's past his prime now, but it doesn't look like it. Like that guy, when he's motivated, I don't think there's anyone better. But, no, absolutely. But yeah. yeah, that's my concern with these guys. But I don't know. I think I just knowing from past comments that Goldberg's made about how he doesn't want to leave on a sour note. My guess is he might try one more and hopefully do it right. And he just gets to fucking... 
put him against someone like Rusev or something. Like, I, I would have no problem with Rusev losing to him in three minutes. I don't think Rusev would have a problem with it either. Because he, he was the same thing with Rusev wrestled The Undertaker. He's like, yeah. look, at, dude, I'm in the room with The Undertaker. And it's like, it's okay for him to lose to Goldberg because no one's going to be like, oh, man, Rusev couldn't beat Goldberg. No, yeah, no, no, absolutely. And it puts Rusev right. on TV, which we don't have exactly. right now. So it's fantastic. Exactly. And it'll make yeah. like, the people be like, oh, Goldberg wrestling. Who's this guy? This guy's fucking great. Yeah. That's like, that's, that's all you have to do. It's just. Take a little bit of like Goldberg's notoriety and rub it all over a guy like Rusev. But, yeah, I you know. agree. I could definitely. I mean, I could see it either way. I could see him saying, you know what, I don't want to go out like that. I'm gonna have one more match. But I mean, then if he comes back and has another match, and it kind of sucks because I don't know if that's where the Undertaker's at right now too. He may not want to leave on a sour note. The problem is, is he can't stop having sour notes. I was gonna like, say he, everything's gotta... been a sour. Like to me, again, his career ended when he left that shit in the rain after Roman Reigns and everything else. I'm trying to push my memory because it's yeah. just fucking brutal. But you know what? We're into the big finish now. Um. I don't know anything that's scheduled yet for next week, but I'm yeah, sure we'll nothing. find out on Saturday. But yeah. Ray, Ray, before we let you go, you got to go to work. Uh, any uh, last words here on your podcast debut here on the Job or Not Guy? Oh, my God. I wasn't prepared for this. I didn't know. I was, you should have told me. I would have written a speech. <laughs> uh, this is fantastic. I was really happy that, uh, that you called me. I'm glad we were able to make this work. Uh, I, I, just a little, like, uh, inside information on people. But uh, my schedule got completely fucked today. And, uh, and it was God getting a little dicey. Ruins. And it literally happened, like, yesterday. Like, we had this whole thing all set up. And then yesterday I get an email that says my entire schedule is changing. And I'm just like, shit. So I just had to fight through rush hour traffic to get here. It was an hour and a half long drive and i had to fucking go through this whatever this rotary is away we oh. it's not even a rotary it's just a bunch of streets that combine in a giant mess like it was just awful but uh you know what we persevere and we push forward and because you know we we we, we trust that you know if if something is going to happen then baron corbin will make it happen if he wills it it sh- then 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 it shall pass i love it so thank you exactly at the stomping ground but before we go i'm gonna stomping quickly ground. Is that not what it's called? Stomping ground. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Take, take, take an ass and kicking names. I miss great balls of fire. But uh, <laughs> as we mentioned earlier, jobbernocker.com. That's our website. Um, 205 Live article. The article on the Usos. NXT, NXT UK recaps coming up there soon. Pro Wrestling Tees. Buy our shirts, man. Jobbernocker. Super hot fire. I saw you were repping it out in Jetta there. You're also repping a Suplex City Jetta shirt right now, which is pretty badass. Uh, so pick those up at Pro Wrestling Tees. Uh, give us five stars, five flames, whether you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, Google Play, Podomatic, everywhere you want to be, right? On social yeah. media. Yeah. So Twitter at Jobbernocker. At WrestleMania, who will be back next week. I'm JC of the JK. You're at Ray Ray of the JK. I went out of order. Shit. At DQ of the JK. At Billy D2411. At Joe Pollock47. At TJ of the JK. And at The Real Deal B Cox. Facebook Jobber Knocker. Instagram Jobber Knocker. We're everywhere you want to be on social media. Love it. So, guys, uh, that's it for us this week. Ray Ray, thanks for coming on the show. Quick correction, though. I'm afraid, uh, like I said, you got to put a little bit more into that thing. It's not just Ray Ray of the JK, <sighs> it's the best in the world Ray Ray of the JK alright well that's pretty good you got good pipes on you but on that note that's it for us we'll see you next week for more Jabba Knockery <laughs>